Hello and welcome to this talk. It's Wednesday the 29th of March. Now, last Friday on the 24th of March, Sir Christopher Chope, one of the members of Parliament in the United Kingdom, gave a speech to the UK Parliament, but uh, two Conservative MPs attended, three Conservative MPs attended, and no one from the opposition uh, attended. Now, we did see recently that there was an MP called uh, Andrew Mitchell who appeared to be uh, dismissing appeared to be dismissing, shooing away two opposition MPs from uh, a speech that was about to be given by uh, Mr Andrew Bridgen. So it looks like, it looked like, of course I don't know, but it looked like there was some conspiracy for no one to listen to any speeches that go against the the, uh, the, the current narrative, shall we say. So I want to give this time to, uh, to, to Sir Christopher Choke. First, let me show you the pictures of who was in the House at the time. Well, here we see Sir Christopher Chope giving his speech, and this is Andrew Bridgen. These two on the front of the ministerial team, so they don't count, and there's two Conservative MPs there have stayed to listen. No one else on the Conservative benches, all completely uh, empty. I consider this to be a boycott type of situation. The opposition benches, completely empty, no one from Labour, no one from the Liberal Democrats, no one from the Scottish Nationalists. Just what is going on here? But we do remember that in the previous video we looked at with Andrew Bridgen, we had this chap, uh, Andrew Mitchell, who seemed to be sending away these two Liberal Democrat MPs, who of course are on the opposite side of the, uh, the parliamentary divide, allegedly. Uh, now, we don't know what uh, Andrew Mitchell said to these MPs, of course, but uh, after he talked to them, they both got up and uh, left. So does look a bit like a boycott, but absolutely incredible. Uh, empty house for Sir Christopher Chope. But if the MPs don't want to listen, maybe you and I do. So let's listen to his speech uh, now. This debate is about the application of the Vaccine Damage Payments Act 1979 to those who have been bereaved or suffered adverse reactions from COVID-19 vaccines. The Act was extended to apply to such vaccines before they were rolled out, but it is now abundantly clear that the Act is totally inadequate for addressing the needs of most of those who have been adversely affected by those vaccines. On Wednesday this week, the Prime Minister told my right honourable friend for rugby and Kenilworth that, and I quote, we are taking steps to reform vaccine damage payment schemes by modernising the operations and providing more timely outcomes. The Prime Minister did not answer or even refer to my right honourable friend's requests that the government should, one, change the £120,000 maximum payment for those seriously injured, and two, end the denial of any payment to those disabled by less than 60%. And this was despite the Prime Minister having received notice of my right honourable friend's question and the fact that both he and I had raised the same points with the Secretary of State for Health weeks ago. My honourable friend, give way. Of course I will. I thank my honourable friend for giving way and commend him for his work on this issue. Has my honourable friend had time to consider the paper produced this week from the Western U Norway University of Applied Science, which found a strongly significant correlation between COVID-19 vaccine uptake in 2021 and excess deaths in the first nine months of 2022 across the European Union and the European Economic Area. In fact, the correlation was so strong that they could, they could state that for every 1% increase in vaccination rates in 2021, there was a 0.1% increase in mortality in 2022. I, I thank my honourable friend for, for that intervention. And I did notice uh, that document because it was drawn to my attention by my honourable friend. But can I suggest to my honourable friend that he tries to engage the good offices of our right honourable friend, uh, who is the chair of the Select Committee on Science and Technology, who I'm delighted to see in his place this afternoon, because I know that this issue is close to his heart as well. So the Minister confirmed to me earlier that uh, the government's answer to both those questions which my right honourable friend put to the Prime Minister is actually no. And it's rather sad that that's so and it's, uh, it's very regrettable I think Mr Deputy Speaker that the Prime Minister didn't actually put that on the record uh, him, himself. 
This month, we have already discussed in this house the scandals surrounding the supply of contaminated blood and the false imprisonment of postmasters under the Horizon project. In both cases, after long resistance, the government was eventually forced into accepting compensation schemes. If the government is interested in tackling the developing scandal over COVID-19 vaccine damage victims, it can and must act now. I fear, however, that it has no will so to do, because it is still in denial about the whole issue. Why do I, do I use that expression? Because at a meeting on the 21st of April last year, I asked the then vaccines minister, the member for Erewash, whether she accepted that some people have died as a direct result of having received a COVID-19 vaccination. She declined to answer the meeting, uh, the, the, the question at the meeting, and said that she would write to me. Um, she didn't do so, so I then had to put down a parliamentary question, um, and this was a parliamentary question 2325, uh, two, and the minister ducked that question. So I asked the same question again to uh, my honourable friend, the minister, bearing in mind that we now know that more than 50 coroner's verdicts have confirmed just this, as that people have died as a direct result of COVID-19 vaccines, and also that her own department has been making awards under the 1979 Act to families which have been bereaved on the basis of that their loved ones also died as a direct result. So will the government unequivocally say today that it does accept that some people have died as a direct result of having received a COVID-19 vaccination. Wasn't it bizarre that all the Prime Minister could say on Wednesday when told about Jamie Scott spending four weeks in a coma and remaining seriously disabled as a result of a COVID vaccination was that he, and I quote, he was sorry to hear about the case. Then in an extraordinary non sequitur, the Prime Minister added, in the extremely rare case of a potential injury from a vaccine covered by the scheme, a one-off payment can be awarded. Yet Jamie Scott's injury is not a potential injury, but a real and substantial one. Nor was it caused by any old vaccine, but by a new experimental COVID vaccine. Sadly, Jamie Scott's case is not unique. I have received hundreds of distressing letters and emails from both victims and bereaved relatives who are desperate for the government and the NHS to listen. Several are from my own constituency. And I quote briefly now from one which I received on the 18th of March from a 24 year old previously employed with a good job in financial services. He had a Pfizer vaccine booster in February 22 and says, within days of the dose, I started experiencing nasty symptoms that resembled those of an autoimmune disease. The symptoms include nausea, headaches, skin rashes, and other immune issues. Despite numerous doctor's visits, blood tests, x-rays, stomach scans, and medicinal prescriptions, doctors have been unable to help these symptoms at all. The symptoms have worsened with time and I've been unable to work over the past seven months or so. I've been unable to receive any disability benefits and have been left to use my entire life savings to fund my food and bills. An expert rheumatologist has now confirmed the link between my constituent symptoms and the Pfizer vaccine. And my constituent asks me and I in turn ask the minister this afternoon, will the government admit that there are cases where these vaccines have caused reactions in people and promise to provide further support and research funding for how these conditions can be managed and hopefully resolved. Yeah. My constituent is but one of so many who have suffered and continue to suffer because they did the right thing on the advice of the government and they received their jabs. The Daily Express, which is the first mainstream newspaper to really start giving this issue some publicity, uh, began its crusade for justice for jab victims with uh, four pages 
uh, in last week's newspaper. On the 15th of March, its leading article entitled Injection of Faith Needed spoke for many when it said, we must take care of the small number of people who suffered side effects as a result of their jabs. Innocent people who have suffered terribly must not be denied the damages they deserve. This is a matter of justice. The situation currently, Mr Deputy Speaker, is that there are over 4,000 claims which have been made under the 1979 Act. Uh, over the past, past five months, new claims have been running at the rate of 250 uh, per month. 2,800 claims remain outstanding and only a, a surprisingly and disturbingly small number have so far uh, been uh, successful. I shall now try to shame the government into action by contrasting their head-in-the-sand approach to vaccine damage victims with what is happening in Germany. On the 12th of March, Professor Dr. Karl Lutebeck, Germany's Federal Minister for Health, gave a disarmingly candid interview to the German TV news channel ZDF. The minister is a scientist and physician of note and previously been Professor of Health Economics and Epidemiology at the Universities of Cologne and Harvard. And as the advisor to Chancellor Merkel, as she then was, at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, uh, he took a very hard line and public has said on numerous occasions that the vaccines must be taken and that they were, I quote, without side effects. He has now admitted in that interview that what he said about them being without side effects was a gross exaggeration. And uh, this is disarmingly frank, isn't it, Mr Deputy Speaker? And he conceded that one in 10,000 of those vaccinated against COVID-19 in Germany had experienced severe adverse effects. He described these as unfortunate cases, and, but as heartbreaking, confirming that some of the severe disablements will be per permanent. And he added, it's really tragic. The minister said that Germany does not yet have drugs for treatment and care in, and that care entitlements are defined very narrowly. But as the understanding of adverse events increased, he recognises the need to get faster at recognising vaccine injuries. And he promised significant extra resources and said that he was in discussion with German Treasury ministers to address issues around post-vaccine syndrome. Sadly, our own government doesn't even recognise post-vaccine uh, syndrome. And I've asked the government questions about whether they would um, report on what has been happening in the University Hospital of Marburg in Germany, uh, where there's a lot of work being done on the diagnosis and treatment of post-vaccination syndrome. I suggested that there might be useful to have some discussions. And in answer to uh, parliamentary question 8879 on the 16th of November, I was told that there are no current plans to do so. Can I ask my honourable friend to reconsider uh, that uh, position? Because it's important that we should get into alignment with Germany, which has got a much more successful health system uh, than ours. And they, are, they have moved from wanting to uh, get everybody vaccinated, or that, that was all done uh, voluntarily, in inverted commas, um, to recognising now that they must do their best to look after those people for whom the vaccine was, a, was a bad, bad news. And what uh, is happening now is that over the past two years in Germany, more than 300,000 cases of vaccine side effects have accumulated in the ministry's own system, and more and more people are lodging compensation claims against the state. 
which based on the contracts which Germany signed uh, with the EU manufacturers, um, is liable for any vaccine related damage. Meanwhile, the subject of vaccine injuries has begun to be openly discussed in the German mainstream media. And let us hope that we're going to see a bit of that developing in our own country, because one of the frustrations of the victims of these vaccines is that there seems to be very uh, much reluctance in the gen mainstream media to engage on this issue. But anyway, now we've got a situation uh, which um, the German health minister is saying, well, let's see if we can get some help from the pharmaceutical companies to voluntarily help compensate those harmed by the vaccines. And he then goes on to say, that's because the profits have been exorbitant. Uh, and um, he, he, just a, a year ago, he'd said the pharmaceutical companies will not get rich uh, with vaccines. But it's one of the privileges, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, of ministers across the world to be able to e eat their words when the, the facts uh, uh, change. So the situation we've got here is one where the government, in, in my submission, needs to completely change its approach and become much more realistic, accommodating, and dare one say it, compassionate towards those um, who did the right thing by the, the public interest and accepted the vaccines. Can I um, ask my honourable friend a whole series of uh, questions it won't be possible for people to uh, follow uh, all these because I can't ask, I haven't got time to read out all the, all the questions. But is the government aware of the 2017 case in the Court of Appeal where the court just said um, that for VDPS service of purposes, loss of faculties um, had where there's a situation where loss of faculties had no real relationship to the kind of injuries set out in Schedule uh, 2 of the relevant statute uh, that relating to the, uh, calculating the percentage of disablement, uh, and that it would be wrong to regard Schedule 2, uh, and which calculates physical disability, for example, if you have a, an amputation below the knee at 60%. And this court decision was that that shouldn't be some kind of a straight jacket. But it seems that it is being used as a kind of straight jacket in the assessment of these COVID vaccine claims. And um, so will my, my honourable friend confirm that the, the government is indeed following that decision in the Court of Appeal? Will she also reconsider this issue about the £120,000 uh, payment, uh, which has been eroded by inflation since 2007? And can she explain why there are still no plans to align the disablement threshold for the VDPS with the England Infested Blood Support Scheme? Because um, un under th that scheme, it is possible to get £100,000 now without any evidence of disability. And um, there doesn't seem to be any alignment between that scheme and the vaccine damage compensation uh, payment, payment scheme. And can my honourable friend explain why the government, having said that they would um, report within the 56 days of, of receiving any prevention of future deaths report from a coroner, can she explain why um, the only such report given to the government, which was delivered on the 13th of October, has still not been the subject of a response? And will she now, in the light of what's happening in Germany, agree to set up specialist clinics to look at um, post-vaccine situations? And can I also ask her how many people are now working on these vaccine uh, claims and whether she sees any prospect of the enormous backlog uh, being uh, reduced uh, quickly. Uh, so 
There are lots of questions there, Mr. Deputy Speaker, but only a small sample of the ones, and I look forward to uh, members of the APPG being able to raise further questions uh, with the Minister when she comes to our meeting.